I will invite Dr. Shamashree Seal to come and talk on her topics and give us an in insight about the newer mechanisms that have now been understood about angle closure at, at, and their clinical relevance. Dr. Shamashree, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I thank Dr. Shaw for giving me the opportunity to speak at this forum. Uh, now, just talking about mechanisms of angle closure and its relevance in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you. It's working. Just shortly going to the epidemiology, we know glaucoma worldwide is 76 million for 2020 figure. And in Asia itself, open angle glaucoma is 53.4%, whereas angle closure stands at 76.7%. And in India itself, 12 million people are affected with glaucoma, among which 1.2 million are already blind. Now coming to what is primary angle closure or what is we call is primary angle closure disease. It is the presence of iridotrabecular contact. This contact may be either appositional or synacral, which can be differentiated by indentation gonioscopy or by uh, manipulation of the angle. This is just a schematic diagram which shows the normal aqueous flow from the ciliary body to the anterior chamber to trabecular meshwork. And when there is an angle closure, this block, there is a blockage and the aqueous cannot flow freely. And as we all know, we can identify the angle only by gonioscopy, which is the gold standard. My next speaker is going to speak on it, so I'm not going into details. The second most important thing is that when we are doing a clinical examination, Anterior chamber examination is very important when we have to do the van herix and we have to compare the anterior chamber depth with the corneal optic section and we have to grade it from 0 to 4. Now according to ISGEO classification, primary angle closure is basically now divided into primary angle closure suspect, primary angle closure and primary angle closure glaucoma. Now, in primary angle closure suspect, what we used to see is there's two at 270 degree uh, trabecular contact, but it has been seen there have been presence of pass and there may be lesser degree of contact. So now the cutoff has been taken as 180 degree to consider it, consider it to be a primary angle closure suspect. What is primary angle closure is when there is total trabecular meshwork obstruction and there are associated features like increased IOP, there is glaucoma flecken, lens opacities, excess pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork, but the main difference is there's no optic disc damage. And in primary angle closure glaucoma, along with PSE features, we have noticed glaucomatous optic neuropathy, which can be corroborated with visual field changes as of glaucoma. Now, a patient may present to us either in an acute stage or in a chronic stage. When he comes to an acute state, it's easier for us to identify the patient as he has symptoms with, with, along with elevated IOP. This occurs mainly due to quick and complete obstruction of the trabecular meshwork. If this is not treated, it may move to chronic stage. And cro in chronic stage, the symptoms are much lesser as the meshwork gets, gets closed up slowly and there may be this pass formation which may be unicentric or multicentric. And as the patient gets time to accommodate to the elevated IOP, the patient does not come with much of symptoms. And we can see there is zippering up of the angle. Now coming to the pathogenesis of angle closure. The newer imaging techniques such as anterior segment OCT and UBM has helped us to look at angle closure in a newer look. Two mechanisms have been considered first crowded anterior chamber and narrow anterior chamber angle. This has been a very common feature where there is obstruction of the normal aqueous when there is 
bowing of the iris and pupillary block. This is a swept source OCT which is showing a normal angle where we can see the scleral spar and trabecular meshwork but when the angle is getting closed we cannot view these features. Now coming to the crowded anterior chamber, the AS OCT has given a new focus to the whole anterior chamber angle. What happened? We can now identify the features like small corneal diameter, shallow anterior chamber depth along with small anterior chamber area and volume. The lens plays an important role, the lens thickness, its anterior position, its lens volume. This all adds up to crowd the anterior chamber. A short axial length lesser than 21 mm, especially seen in nanophthalmic patient, is a very big risk factor. Along with this, we can see anteriorly rotated ciliary body, greater iris volume, larger iris curvature, and we have seen that in patients with their increasing age, they increase the, there is increase in the thickness of the lens, and so PSEG is more common in ages above 40 years. This is a, just a schematic diagram showing a normal open angle and there is crowding of the anterior chamber because of the increase in the lens thickness, volume and there is bone of iris and rotation of ciliary body. To sum up all these pathogenic factors, we can start at the genetics which starts at bo our body with the anatomical features of crowding of the angle, the iris changes, the lens changes with uveal expansion and certain living habits, mood, weather, other features and with increasing age we land up in a PACG. Now this PACG may occur by two mechanisms as we know by pupillary block or non-pupillary block. Pupillary block occurs when there is a proximity between the lens and the posterior surface of the iris. It generates a pressure between the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber and forces the peripheral iris to bow anteriorly and causes a pupillary block. But in a non-pupillary block, mainly the iris plays an important factor. There is thick peripheral iris, anteriorly located peripheral iris, anteriorly rotated ciliary body and plateau iris. As we know, this is an entity which plays an important role in angle closure. What happens in this, we can see in the UVM picture, there is iridocorneal contact, there is anteriorly rotated ciliary body, there is angulation of the iris and absent uh, ciliary sulcus. This can be seen gonioscopically as double hem pattern or sine wave sign. Now we have to stage the condition when the patient presents to us. We have to identify the patient because our treatment protocol will depend on the stage he presents to us. It may present to us in a preclinical stage. When we are doing a routine gonioscopy, we see there are occludable angles. We have to treat them accordingly or in cases in uh, which the patient had undergone an acute attack, the other eye is susceptible to angle closure. They may pre present as acute at attack. This attack may be mild where there are small spikes in IOP and patient may see colored halos, cloudy vision, mild eye congestion and this occurs mainly due to inc incomplete angle closure. Acute attack is more easily identifiable fireable because of sudden rise of IOP which may be above 70 mm of Hg. Patient typically presents with intense eye pain. There is nausea, vomiting, conjunctival hyperemia, corneal edema, mid dilated pupil, along with flat anterior chamber, and we can see the typical triple sign where there is pigmented precipitates, irregular iris atrophy, and glaucoma flecken. Patient come certain certain patient comes with intermittent stage where after an acute attack, which may be mild or acute, the half of the open angle opens up. But he is in a dangerous condition because he may go into acute attack at any point of time. Chronic stage is a stage where the IOP has progressively ele elevated. It has caused significant optic nerve damage and this occurs because of more than half closure of the angle. An absolute stage or the end stage is when the eyeball loses visual function, usually with refractory eye pain. This is how a patient passes from preclinical stage to acute stage which may be mild attack or acute attack to intermittent stage. Sorry. 
chronic attack and an absolute stage. Now, there are certain clinical uh, conditions which may predispose a patient to angle closure like a pupillary dilatation at outdoor examination may cause a iris and choroid to uh, di uh, effusion and that may lead to angle closure. And certain drugs have been found to cause uh, choroidal effusion like bronchodilators, SSRI, TCA, muscle relaxants and antiepileptics. So, our take home message is doing a proper clinical examination to identify the stage that the patient may go into a primary angle closure is important and for that gonioscopy is a very essential and must along with the antechamber assessment which may be helped out with newer imaging techniques, assessment of the stage in which the patient presents to us so that we can intervene at the proper time and can prevent the patient from going from PSCS to PSCG and thus a regular follow-up is needed so that the patient does not end in blindness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shamashree for a very comprehensive presentation regarding the causes of pupillary block and non-pupillary block mechanisms of angle closure diseases. Because normally angle closure diseases, we used to only think that pupillary block is the only way that it is happening. And nowadays there is a lot of focus on crowded anterior chambers attributed by the iris, the lens, the ciliary body and the corneal measurements. Everything has a role to play in PACD and it varies from patient to patient. And if we can detect them correctly, then we can treat them in a more focused